Next, we have Joanna Gorka. She is a fourth year medical student here at the University of Utah. And she'll be presenting a case of abnormal eye movements. I'm excited to share a case of abnormal eye movements in a pediatric patient. I'd like to give a big, amazing thank you to the neuro ophthalmology team. I've had some great learning experiences over the past month. And a quick disclaimer, I will be showing some patient videos, but those will be edited out, edited out prior to publishing just to protect patient safety. So our patient is a 14-year-old female presenting with dizziness and eye beating. She's had seven months of episodes of dizziness, headaches, and instability, now an increasing frequency. Her mom has noticed that her eyes are beating back and forth intermittently, and now that beating has become fairly constant. She, the patient has also noted significant worsening of her vision over the last six months, even while wearing her glasses. She also notes some intermittent double vision. It's unclear whether it's monocular or binocular. Digging a little deeper into her history, at age eight, she developed some mild nystagmus and blurry vision. She got some glasses and, and was sent home. At age 12, she developed some tremoring and twitching of her upper extremities. She was seen for an EEG, which was unremarkable. They also gave her a Kepra load. She continues to have some periodic uh, upper extremity movements. Her history is significant for ADHD, as well as some behavioral difficulties. She was previously on atomoxetine, but not currently on any medications. Of note, her biological mother and grandmother had some sort of nystagmus. However, they're no longer in contact, so we don't have the full story on that. Uh, she's had no past head traumas, but some possible alcohol exposure in her infancy. No other preceding infections or illnesses, and no known exposures to strep. On exam, her visual acuity with her glasses was 2050 and 2060, no pupillary defects. Her visual fields were full to confrontation and single Maddox rod testing showed a two prism diopter exophoria. Her color plates were full, stereopsis was nearly full. Her slit lamp and fundus exam were completely unremarkable. She does wear glasses with a minus four sphere. On neurological exam, she had normal cranial nerve functioning, as well as normal motor sensory coordination and reflexes. Those were two out of four throughout. No truncal ataxia was noted on exam, negative Romberg. Of note, she was unable to do tandem gait. She was okay with tiptoe and heel walk, but not tandem gait. A quick review of nystagmus and psychotic intrusions, just to help narrow down what we're seeing in this patient. So nystagmus is differentiated from these intrusions as it involves a slow phase. Opsoclonus is a psychotic intrusion and it involves multi-directional saccades occurring in all directions of gaze. Similarly, ocular flutter is also rapid, but these movements are purely horizontal. You can also have square wave jerks, which are rapid movements away from and back to a fixation target after a brief pause. This one is different from opsoclonus and ocular flutter just because it has a intersaccadic interval. So in our patient, her eye movements are most consistent with opsoclonus. She also has some features, although somewhat variable, of myoclonus as well as that ataxia noted on exam. Her presentation is overall most consistent with opsoclonus myoclonus syndrome or OMS also sometimes called dancing eyes, dancing feet syndrome, which reminds me of one of my favorite movies. The disorder is, or the syndrome, is characterized by the findings in its name, as well as some behavioral and sleep difficulties, which our patient also had. It's thought to be an acquired immune-mediated disorder. It responds best to immunosuppression. And there are two leading pathophysiology theories First one, focusing on the brain stem, there's thought to be some alterations in the membrane properties of the psychotic burst cells, leading to increased neuronal excitability and decreased inhibition from the omnipause cells. The cerebellar theory looks at the Purkinje cells. Um, they're thought to be dysfunctional and failing to inhibit the fastitial nucleus. This reinforces that inhibition of the omnipause cells. Uh, in terms of the histopathology of patients, 
uh, of, of the brains of patients that they examined, they have found some gliosis and inflammation in that cerebellar vermis, kind of supportive of that cere cere cerebellar theory. Overall, this is a very rare syndrome, but it's more characterized in the pediatric population. In fact, uh, we classically know of its association with neuroblastoma. 50% of OMS kids have an underlying neuroblastoma with the mean age of diagnosis around two years of age. Occasionally, they have also found some ovarian teratomas as the cause. For adults, 20 to 40% are paraneoplastic with the mean age of diagnosis around 55. The main culprits are small cell lung cancer, carcinoma, and breast adenocarcinoma. For both the pediatric and adult populations, uh, one cause of OMS is thought to be infectious. And, and it, we'll talk a bit more about that in this slide. This is a great flow chart from the 2019 update on oxyclonus and myoclonus syndrome. This one focuses on the presentation in adults. You can see they split it up into perineoplastic etiology and idiopathic etiology, which involves parainfectious. On the right, you can see the common infections that are associated with OMS in adults, HIV, mycoplasma, salmonella, rotavirus, CMV, hep C, and some others. Similar infections observed in children, but also include Coxsackie, Lyme disease, EBV, strep. There have even been some recent case reports uh, proposing COVID as a cause. On the left, you can see some of the known anti-neuronal antibodies implicated in OMS. However, the majority of patients with OMS are actually seronegative. Let's talk about the workup for this gal. We did a very thorough perineoplastic evaluation looking for neuroblastoma, her urine BMA and HVA were normal. Abdominal ultrasound was done to look for teratomas. There was a cyst structure on her left ovary, which we'll talk about. Um, she had some other thorough imaging, as well as some labs, LDH, alpha, fetal protein, and beta HCG were all normal. Her ASO was negative. Some other antibodies and panels were sent out. Her lumbar puncture was normal. Of note, in patients with OMS, the CSF is typically normal or might show some mild elevations of protein or mild lymphocytic gliocytosis. No oligoclonal bands, HIV, RPR were negative, and her vitamins were also normal. So here is that left-sided para-ovarian cyst. Uh, or, or thought to be paraovarian cysts that we saw. This was imaged with MRI. She had a great team of radiology, gynecology, oncology, who all agreed that this is just a simple paratubal or paraovarian cyst, not concerning for teratoma. So that's reassuring. She also had MRI of the whole body performed, showing nonspecific focus of high T2 signal in, and diffusion restriction in an area typically where paragangliomas can be found. This was re-imaged with CT, which didn't show any findings at that site. Her brain, MRI, and PET scan were also unremarkable. For genetic testing, we sent out some panels. Of note, she had a couple of variants of unknown significance. For example, platelet-derived profactor receptor, which is implicated in primary familial brain calcification. That one, there was found to be a variant. But not nothing too related to OMS. She had some variants in her inborn errors of immunity and cytopenia panel. Of note, her glycine alpha-1 antibody was negative. This one is associated with encephalopathies and movement disorders. Some other panels of her spinal fluid were also negative. She did have a mildly elevated GAD65 antibody. So this is glutamic acid decarboxylase. It's an enzyme involved in the production of GABA. It's been directly linked to stiff person syndrome, cerebellar ataxia, as well as a few cases in patients with oxyclonus myoclonus. However, her titer was very low, a uh, pretty low positive predictive value on it. So in summary, we have no outstanding culprits. We did a thorough neoplastic evaluation. Genetic testing showed some small maybes. Perhaps our patient's onset of OMS is actually infectious. 
or to something we have not identified yet. Treatment of OMS involves, if it's neoplastic, involves resection of the underlying neoplasm. Beyond that, the major tenant of treatment is early intensive immunosuppression. So our patient got five days of IV methylpret in the hospital, maybe had some days of improvement. She was sent home with six weeks of oral prednisone, had, had some IVIG, no benefit with that. And she's had rituximab treatments on and off, unclear if she's experiencing much benefit from that one as well. The Mitchell and Pike rating scale is helpful for assessing the severity of disease and monitoring response to therapy. The categories they look at are stance, gait, arm hand function, oxyclonus, mood behavior, and speech. In fact, the majority of OMS patients have some sort of cognitive or behavioral problems. So our patient was recently seen for follow-up. She's now 16 years old. And although somewhat of an unsatisfying ending to this case, as we still don't know what's going on, and she continues to have this oxyclonus, not super responsive to treatment. However, she appears to be adapting better. She's doing well in online school. Here we can take a look at her movements today. Very similar to her previous presentation. She's also had some more episodes of arm shaking. She had a repeat spot EEG, which was unremarkable. And then her para-ovarian cyst was re-imaged with MRI. It was shown to be stable or even somewhat a little, a little smaller. So at this point, patient might be interested in pursuing some more genetic testing. In summary, OMS is a rare entity thought to be immune uh, mediated. Thorough neoplastic evaluation is important, even though it might not always yield an answer. Treatment involves early immunosuppression, and the outcomes for OMS are quite variable, as we can see with this patient. She continues to have oxyclonus and not much response to her treatments. There's still so much to be discovered about this uh, syndrome. The majority of the studies I, were, I was looking at are on the order of 10 to 20 patients, so hopefully more insights are on the horizon. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Joanna. Next, we have a second-year medical student in, at the University of Utah. This is Samuel Ahanonu. He was our summer research student this summer, and he will be presenting on comparing normal weight and obese patients with pseudotumorous Reifert syndrome. Good morning, all. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Um, so typically, when we think about a, a patient with pseudotumor cere cerebri syndrome or uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, we think of a female patient of reproductive age uh, with obesity. But what about the patients with normal BMI? Do they present differently? And how do they present differently? Um, and these are some of the questions that we sought to explore through this research project. <clears throat> I have no financial dis disclosures, but I was part of the MSRP NIH uh, T35 grant um, for summer research. So with a little bit of background, um, pseudotumor cerebri syndrome, uh, PTCS, is defined as increased uh, intracranial pressure, um, papilledema, normal imaging, and uh, normal spinal fluid. And one of the severe complications of this uh, condition is vision loss. And this condition can severely uh, impact the lives of our patients. So with primary PTCS, uh, idiopath idiopathic uh, intracranial hypertension, or IAH, uh, so the two main risk factors are uh, being assigned female at birth and um, obesity. So we sought to investigate the presentation and outcomes of normal weight and obese uh, PTCS patients. So uh, we reviewed 898 PTCS patients of the Moran Eye Center that were seen from 1999 to earlier this year, 2024. We excluded patients that had uh, no reported BMI at presentation, which left us with 591 patients. We compared age of presentation, uh, sex assigned at birth, 
symptoms of, at presentation, uh, duration of illness, recurrence of symptoms, causes of PTCS, visual acuity grade, uh, Humphrey visual field mean deviation, papillodema grade, and ultimately treatment. And uh, for this uh, statistical analysis, we set the significance value at 0.05. Our results in terms of demographic symptoms and cause include the following. First, there was a similar sex pre presentation across both groups, uh, predominantly female as expected. Second, the normal weight cohort presented at a younger uh, mean age uh, overall. Um, additionally, uh, the normal weight cohort presented with more diplopia, whereas the uh, group with obesity presented more with uh, transient visual obscurations. The normal weight patients uh, typically had uh, a secondary cause uh, to their PTCS, particularly with medication-induced PTCS with the main, um, the main uh, medication being minocycline. And then additionally, uh, the obese group did have more of a history of migraine. One key finding that we did have from this study was that there was no statistically significant difference between the two groups with visual acuity, um, Humphrey visual field mean deviation, and papilledema at presentation or at the most recent follow-up. Um, our results in terms of treatment and recurrence, um, normal weight patients re required fewer surgeries and of note, no uh, normal weight patient received optic nerve sheath fenestration as treatment for their condition. Additionally, uh, normal weight patients had a shorter duration of illness and fewer recurrences of symptoms once um, in remission. In conclusion, normal weight patients uh, and, and uh, patients with obesity with uh, PTCS um, had visual, similar visual outcomes despite differences in presentation and uh, disease course. And continuing to characterize the um, different PTCS populations may help us to better understand the underlying pathophysiology of this condition. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Allison Crum. She's going to give us an update on an upcoming clinical trial for new medication for thyroid eye disease. I think every once in a while, when I swallow my nerves to start a presentation, how amazing our medical students are. Let's give them another round of applause today. That's a great job. Thank you guys for presenting. Um, we wanted to tell you a little bit about a clinical trial that we're presenting today. Um, it, we are um, working with Viridian. And Viridian is uh, a company that has uh, decided to um, come up with a medication that is similar to tepratumumab. As um, in neuroophthalmology, we see a lot of patients come in and they have drastic changes in their clinical features that occur because of thyroid eye disease. And some of these patients uh, don't go out in public anymore. Some of these patients have difficulty with their social relationships. And uh, thyroid eye disease has changed, as Dr. Katz mentioned, drastically over the past four to five years because of tepratumumab. In the past, we had used some artificial teardrops or some gel or ointment at nighttime. Um, maybe we could put you on high-dose steroids that might predispose you to osteoporosis or a broken hip. We could irradiate your body, or we could even do surgery where we remove some of the bones. So a lot of these discussions were um, patients who were at the end of their tether, really frustrated with what life had dealt them. And now we have tepratumumab. 
It was approved in January of 2020. Um, they discovered that the IGF insulin growth factor receptor was closely associated with the TSH receptor. And by blocking that, you decrease the cytokine response that causes in inflammation, but also you stop the deposition of the glycosaminoglycans. And thus you can stop the potential proptosis, diplopia. Now, of course, as, as Dr. Wirtz mentioned, there are some, some um, things that make this medication not an exactly a, a silver bullet or a perfect treatment. Some patients do recur, some patients don't achieve um, the strides that others have uh, demonstrated in some of the clinical trials. So a uh, company um, approached us, uh, Viridian. Viridian said, we would like to trial a medication and do a clinical study. And this is a multiple ascending dose safety tolerability and efficacy study of the Viridian medication. It's a humanized monoclonal antibody directed against the IGF-1 receptor, similar to the tepertumumab, which is also directed against this same receptor. And it is going to be done in normal healthy volunteers and subjects with thyroid eye disease. So the trial design is, as one would expect, a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled study. The number of patients and participants are roughly 150. There are a number of trial sites. There are 80 sites um, spread across the globe. And the only inclusion criteria that they have are that the patient is older than 18 years old and that has had thyroid eye disease that has begun roughly 15 months prior to screening. The objectives of this study are to establish the pharmacokinetics of Viridian 001 in healthy volunteers and thyroid eye disease patients over a dose range of three to 20 milligrams per kilogram. For tepertumumab, the, they have infusions of tepertumumab. They go to an infusion center. The first infusion is 20 milligrams per kilogram. And then every three weeks, they have another infusion for a total of eight infusions, a total of 24 weeks of infusions. So the first infusion is again, the 20 milligrams per kilogram. And then every infusion after that is 10 milligrams per kilogram. In the Viridian study, three dose levels will be evaluated three, which is a fairly low dose, 10, which will be the middle dose, and 20, which will be a high dose. The um, study is going to um, enroll patients in which they will um, use the higher dose initially, and then they um, prove that that medication can be tolerated at the higher dose before they infuse it into multiple patients at the ascending doses, um, just to confirm the safety endpoints. Um, primary efficacy endpoints are similar to what the tepertumumab study showed, which is hopefully to improve proptosis. Of course, secondary endpoints can include um, clinical activity score changes. Um, and then exploratory endpoints are um, proptosis, the dur durability of whether the proptosis remains um, remains improved, um, a time to how fast the proptosis resolves, uh, clinical activity responder rate, and two or three pages of other exploratory end endpoints that they're going to determine. So um, exophthalmometry is that little device um, that you often see in NeuroOp and sometimes Oculoplastics Clinic, that where we measure how far forward the eyes are in comparison to one another, but also in comparison to the lateral orbital brim. This is the clinical activity score. Uh, you have uh, a scale that 
each uh, point, symptoms, signs, or changes are graded zero to one. And commonly, a clinical activity score of greater than four, three to four is graded as an active thyroid eye disease. They're also going to be using the UGOGO classification of thyroid eye disease, which suggests that any patient has moderate to severe thyroid eye disease if they have a significant impact on daily life. So discomfort, pain, intermittent periods of double vision might be um, some of those signs. Any questions? Exciting. It sounds like it's going to be a little shorter um, uh, uh, number of, few, of infusions. Yes, hopefully. I'd be interested to hear about the hearing loss. But, you know, in the in the population, middle to upper aged folks already have hearing loss. Most of the guys at the VA have tinnitus for sure. And um, putting them on a potentially ototoxic medication, a lot of the symptoms resolve, but uh, a tinnitus, but not always. So anyway, I have this presentation as a just in case we're we're um, done with all our presentations. There's a little more knowledge we can squeeze in. So um, I learned about this um, when I was working down at Mid Valley, uh, courtesy of Emily and Angela. So I'd never heard of this, and I figured since I'd never heard of it, maybe other people hadn't heard of it. So um, slow visual field testing. I saw a 66 year old guy. Uh, referred because of worsening visual fields. Um, he complains of eye pain and starbirth after cataract surgery, very light sensitive. Um, his examination, uh, 2030 vision, color vision normal, fundus examination was normal. He had dry eyes. The pain was better with EPO 41 and uh, topical preparacaine. But this was his visual field testing that he had had in the years prior. So 2023, um, he'd had these sort of um, visual field results, shall we say. And um, uh, these tests um, each took about seven minutes. It's a full 30-2 threshold testing. So those are, um, even though it's a C to fast, those are fairly uh, lengthy tests. Um, and then he came in with this. Um, this is what prompted the referral. Um, the foveal threshold is off, but these are, uh, it's um, seven, almost eight minutes on the left and uh, six, almost seven minutes on the right. Uh, so this was what prompted the referral. I mean, these are pretty concerning visual field defects and worsening. Um, uh, he was also under evaluation by neurology for cognitive slowing. Uh, his wife noticed that he was more short-tempered. He had worsening hearing loss in both ears. Um, and so Emily, um, realizing after checking his vision that he was very slow, um, decided um, on her own initiative, which was a good thing she didn't ask me because I wouldn't have had a clue, how about if we do the slow visual field testing? And this is what this showed. And here we are, it takes about the same amount of time. This is a, a seven and a half, almost eight minute test in the left eye, uh, six and a half, almost seven minute test in the right eye. Again, it, it it's a 24-2, um, uh, so theoretically it should be a little slower. Uh, it's a, still a three size stimulus, but this, um, Mark matches much, much better with his fund examination, which was normal, and his acuity, and his actual symptoms, which are sort of the glare and um, difficulty that he was having with his multifocal lenses. Um, so uh, I just wanted to bring this concept to your attention. This is obviously an enormous change uh, between that and this. I think we could all pass these visual fields as being okie dokie. It still says C to fast. I know. It is. So um, this is how you find it. It's available on the the latest version of Humphrey HVV, HVF3. Um, uh, uh, Emily mentioned to me the liquid lens visual field, which is the field that has kind of like a, the lens that they use for correction is not just a series of uh, tap-in lenses. It's kind of like a, I don't know, liquid lens. I don't know anything about it. Maybe like they're working on with the intraocular lenses, some sort of gooey technology. Anyway, so when you're trying to do this field, you go, you select the patient, and then you go to the test parameters and you go to test speed, which is a thing, and there's a drop down arrow, then you can select slow. 
And that is all the parameters that are usually just automatically um, uh, pre-selected, pattern, strategy, super threshold. We don't use blue, yellow much, but sometimes the stimulus color, stimulus size, right? That would be three versus five versus one. Um, the way the fixation, target, and monitoring are done. Test speed, foveal threshold in neuro-ophthalmology, that's a must do, right? We use that all the time. Um, and the fluctuation. Some of these are um, not available on all um, uh, machines, but again, I just wanted to mention, this is a thing. It can be extremely useful for some of our older patients. I think this guy was not only slowed cognitively, but he was quite hard of hearing. So there was a lot of bellowing that had to happen to get uh, the communication going. Um, and I thought it just was a useful tip for anybody who might want to um, deploy that in the future. Do you have any questions? Yeah.